In 134 BCE, a man named John Harkanus ascended to the role of high priest and national ruler of Judea. Fighting for independent rule of Judea, his first year was marked by a siege from the Seleucid Empire. After six difficult years, the Seleucid king Antiochus VII died, and Hyrcanus was free to expand the Jewish state and thrust Judea into the role of the most powerful and influential land in the Levant. In 110 BCE, lands to the north were conquered, and John Hyrcanus annexed the land of Israel. To legitimize the annexation, the idea of a unified Jewish state was put forth. According to him, this was no conquest, but a return to a golden era in which Israel and Judea were united. Non-Jews living in the region were forced to adopt Jewish customs and temples to Yahweh were destroyed, forcing worshipers to send their offerings to Jerusalem. To this day, Archaeology can find no evidence that such a golden age ever existed. No evidence that Israel and Judea were ever united prior to the conquest of John Hyrcanus in 110 BCE. I'm your host Jason, and you're listening to Dragons in Genesis. We ended the last episode right after David killed Goliath, and learned that the story originally belonged to the hero Elhanan, who had killed the same giant Philistine in 2 Samuel 21. Just as King Saul had several introductory stories, David's victory over Goliath was his third introduction. The authors liked all three stories, and so the character kept making first appearances. And this brings us up to 1 Samuel chapter 18. Now that Saul has been introduced to David repeatedly and under various circumstances, he finally recognizes the boy's military might and sends him off to fight against the Philistines. David marches off with a small army and the slaughter begins. But this plan backfired for King Saul. When the boy general returned, the women of Israel went out to greet the victorious hero, and they all began singing about Saul killing thousands and David killing tens of thousands. I imagine this like a scene from a Disney cartoon in which one Israelite girl hears the marching troops and rushes to the window singing about the hero, and all the village women join in, each of them instantly knowing the lyrics that the first girl just invented. Saul, understandably upset by the synchronized dancing and musical outburst, recognized that a popular military hero could be a danger to his reign. If Saul was unsure what to do about this new potential rival, the decision was quickly taken from his hands. In 1 Samuel 18.10, we're told that evil spirits from Yahweh possessed Saul and caused him to throw a spear at David. Luckily, Yahweh's accuracy with a javelin didn't match up to David's accuracy with a sling. The God-possessed Saul missed, and David managed to escape. The story instantly repeats with Saul trying again to kill David with a spear. Essentially, what we have here are two different versions of the same story in which Saul is possessed by Yahweh and goes on a murderous rampage. This story will pop up again later in this episode. This is the beginning of a series of fits, which will plague the relationship between King Saul and his faithful servant David for the remainder of Saul's life. Yahweh is constantly possessing the man and causing him to attack David. In each case, it reads like a fit of anger combined with an unhealthy level of paranoia. It seriously makes me wonder if this aspect of the story, the king randomly assaulting those close to him, isn't based on some historical figure who suffered some kind of mental illness. After the two failed murder attempts, Saul sends David to the head of his army with a thousand troops. The goal here is to let the enemy do the dirty work. While this strategy fails for Saul, 
David will remember it later and implement it when he takes a liking to a married woman and needs to get rid of her husband. David and his band of troops are successful in every battle, so Saul tries a new trick to prevent David from usurping him. He gives his oldest daughter to David as a wife. But this marriage doesn't quite pan out, and so Saul offers his second daughter, Michal, to David. When he inquires about the bride price, Saul asks for 100 Philistine foreskins. My girlfriend's father demanded the same, but since most men in America are circumcised, I was only to acquire about a dozen, and that's why the two of us aren't married. David, ecstatic at the opportunity to mutilate male genitalia, runs off and collects not 100, but 200 Philistine foreskins and returns them to Saul, where he then counts them out before the king. And you can imagine this going down sort of like a scene from Sesame Street, with David counting them out one foreskin. Ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. Anyway, now David was a general, had the blessing of Yahweh, and was married to a royal daughter, which made Saul even more fearful. So basically, the king was creating his own enemy and working diligently to make the man more dangerous. Now, this King Saul, this version of the man, is a far cry from the man we saw in the first half of this book. All of his cleverness and cunning are gone, and he's either in a murderous rage or he's a bumbling idiot. Saul then orders his son Jonathan and all his servants to kill David, which of course didn't work because Jonathan was David's best friend. Jonathan manages to talk Saul out of the idea and got the pair to sit down and make peace, so David could once again do what he did best, which was kill Philistines for the king. At that point, Yahweh once again seized Saul and forced him to attack David with a spear again. David again dodges and flees. This now gives us our third version of the Yahweh-possessed Saul trying to skewer his servant story. In each case, the same reason is given. An evil spirit of Yahweh possesses Saul and forces his hand. Saul isn't trying to kill David most of the time. When he has a clear head, he's making peace with the boy. This is indicative of a time when people believed that mental illness or any aberrant behavior was caused by the possession of some spirit. After this latest episode, Saul sends spies to watch David so he can dispatch him in the morning. But his daughter Milcal, David's wife, warns David and helps him escape through the window. To confuse the spies, they hid one of the household gods in David's bed. This was called a teraphim. It was a statue of one of their ancestors. And the deception worked, and David was able to avoid capture. He meets up with the prophet Samuel, and together the two of them run off to Navath, where some of Saul's men catch up to them. But Yahweh intervenes and convinces the soldiers to leave David alone. You would think that a god appearing in person and telling you to leave someone alone would be enough to get the message across, but apparently it's not because the soldiers once again go after David and once again Yahweh has to intervene. And then it happens a third time. After three failed attempts, Saul takes it upon himself to kill David. Now you might be thinking that Yahweh might intercept Saul and convince him to leave David be, or perhaps possess him and cause him to start throwing spears again. If so, you'd be wrong. Yahweh does possess the king, and this time he causes him to strip naked, lie on the ground, and begin speaking prophecy nonstop for an entire day. This behavior, strange as it might seem to us, convinces everyone around that Saul is a legitimate prophet which makes us wonder what kind of shenanigans the other prophets got up to. With the king out to get him, David goes on the run again, 
And at the beginning of chapter 20, he asks his best friend, Jonathan, what he did to anger the king. Jonathan says he'll talk to his dad during the New Moon Festival and try to find out. And in case you're wondering, yes, the ancient Israelites held pagan New Moon Festivals, and such is being referenced here. At the feast, Saul notices that David's seat is empty and asks why he didn't attend. Perhaps he forgot about all the times he tried to shank David with a spear. Jonathan tells his father that David simply returned home to Bethlehem to make his new moon sacrifice with his family. Saul then flies into another rage, called Jonathan's mother a whore, and tried to kill his son with a spear, giving us yet another version of this particular attempted homicide scene. Naturally, Jonathan flees the palace. After hearing the news, David fled the area. He seeks out the priest Abimelech for help. Since these stories were in a relative state of flux for centuries and drew upon older fables, it's impossible to know if this is supposed to be the same Abimelech mentioned in the Abraham story or in the book of Judges. Abimelech gives David and his men food, which turns out to be the bread of the presence, which is the holy shoe bread, which is filled with the spirit of Yahweh or Asherah. It's basically an ancient Jewish version of the Christian Eucharist. Abimelech also gives David Goliath's sword. After David leaves, Saul hears of Abimelech's aid and instructs his men to kill the priest. They refuse because, you know, they're not going to go and kill one of Yahweh's priests. So Saul has a Syrian man do his dirty work. Not only is Abimelech killed, but all of the priests associated with him are also killed. Then Saul has Abimelech's family killed, along with every person who lived in the city Abimelech was from, and all of the animals. That's pretty harsh. While on the run from Saul, David hears that the Philistines are raiding a border city. So he gathers up 400 men and attacks, driving the enemy back, but attracting Saul in the process. Saul and David then go on to play a game of cat and mouse, but David's smaller army is able to elude the king. During the search, Saul's army was camped outside of a cave, and the king went inside to rest. Unbeknownst to him, David and his entire army were hiding inside of that very cave. David's men encouraged him to kill the king, but he refused since Saul had been appointed by Yahweh. So instead, he sneaks up on King Saul in the shadows and cuts off a patch from his clothing. After Saul leaves the cave, David comes rushing out after him and shows him the cloth, claiming that he is no threat to the king. If he wanted Saul dead... He would have done it in the caves. Saul and David make peace, and David promises that when he eventually becomes king, he will not end Saul's lineage. This seems to appease Saul, and the two of them get along happily ever after. Or maybe not. Around this time, the prophet Samuel dies, and he is mourned by all of Israel. David, no longer pursued by Saul, doesn't have anything else to do, so he decides to become a career criminal. I'm not certain about this, but this might actually be the oldest literary example of a protection racket. David and his band of mercenaries find a man with several thousand sheep and goats, and demand he pay them off not to attack him. When he refuses, David orders the slaughter. But the man's wife takes an offering to David and begs him not to kill her entire family. We learn here that David's goal was to kill all the men and all of the male children and take the women and girls for himself. So he sounds a bit like Moses. David chooses not to kill the men and boys, and so Yahweh does it for him, and David then manages to capture the widow and force her to become another of his wives, 
but as his former enemy, she is set so low she has to bow down to the ground and promise to wash the feet of his servants. I'm sure proponents of biblical marriage kind of skip this chapter. Now, you remember that scene earlier when Saul took 3,000 men to chase David and David managed to sneak up on him to prove that he wasn't a threat? Chapter 26 has a second version of this story. David is on the run again because Saul is trying to chase him again. David is also hanging out with his good friend Abimelech again, who is apparently back from the dead. Perhaps the editors should have placed this version of the story at the end of chapter 21 before Abimelech was killed. So David's hanging out with zombie Abimelech and Saul's army is camped nearby. Again, as in the previous version, David's men encourage him to kill King Saul. And again, David refuses because it would be wrong to kill Yahweh's anointed. So, he sneaks into camp, steals Saul's spear, probably the one that he's been trying to skewer everyone with since the beginning of the story, and he also takes a pitcher of water. The next morning, David approaches the army and accuses Saul's guards of negligence and produces the stolen goods as proof of their ineptitude. Once again, Saul apologizes to David, and the two of them make peace. Like, for real this time. Like, it's going to stick. No more running. All right. So, David is no longer on the run. The very next sentence states that David had to escape, and he is on the run from Saul. So, this time, he decides to join forces with the Philistines. I mean, he's done everything else. Why not try something new? Now that David is no longer in Israel, the Bible tells us that he is forced to serve other gods. Now, why would that be the case? Why would he suddenly cease to worship Yahweh once he leaves Israel? This is a reflection of the ancient customs. Gods were local. They were patron deities of cities or nations, or sometimes even just a hilltop or a mountain or an oasis. A god's influence might be limited to a grove of trees. When you visited another city or another nation, you were forced to worship the local god because your god was in his hometown. Your god was on his own mountain in his own nation. The only real way to continue worshiping your favorite deity was to bring that god along with you. Which is why we see so many references in the Old Testaments about these little stone gods, such as Genesis 31:19, when Rachel stole the household gods from her father, or earlier in 1 Samuel 19:13, when David's wife placed one of the household gods in David's bed to convince the guards that he was still asleep. Gods were not yet omnipresent. They were localized, and sometimes they were made of stone. So once David is outside of the land of Israel, he is cut off from Yahweh, because Yahweh's influence extends only so far, and that ends at the border of Israel, not into the land of the Philistines. But David didn't just join any group of Philistines. He joined the men of Gath. That's right, David is now working for Goliath's people. He's working with them, attacking the enemies of the Philistines, and killing everyone he comes across, male and female. He captures all of their animals and gives them over to King Ancus of Gath, and he becomes such a friend to the Philistines that the king made David captain of his personal bodyguard. Meanwhile, Saul has shut down all diviners and wizards in the land of Israel. This detail places the scene firmly in the time of the Deuteronomic reform, as divining and magic conducted by those outside the temple was normal prior to this period. 
It was the view of the Deuteronomist redactors that only the high priest should use magic and give prophecy. Why is this important? Because the Philistines decided to turn their attention on Israel once again, and when they invaded, Saul needed guidance. He went first to Yahweh, using the trappings of the high priest to get in touch with the deity, but received no answer. Now he's stuck. He can't visit a local soothsayer because he had recently outlawed the practice. So his servants tracked down a woman called the Witch of Endor. Now, Endor might be a town somewhere near Jerusalem, or perhaps a forest moon populated by Ewoks. Either way, Saul went there and asked her to summon a spirit to guide him. Now, he wears the disguise because he can't be seen patronizing a witch immediately after outlawing witchcraft. He promises the witch that she won't be ratted out to the cops, and she summons the spirit he desires, that of the recently deceased Samuel. Upon seeing Samuel's ghost, the witch realizes who her client must be, King Saul, and she freaks out. But the king calms her down. She then relates to him what she saw in her vision with this ghost. She saw a god rising up out of the earth. She then repeats the report, but this time states that it's a man rising up from the earth, and he's dressed in the mantle of the high priest. If you've been keeping up with this podcast, then you'll recognize the significance of this scene. If not... See episode 36 concerning the atonement ritual. What we have here is a reference to the high priest, an earthly being resurrected as a god or an angel and ascending. This also reflects the ancestor worship common in virtually every ancient culture. The spirits of the deceased are just a phone call away, ready to give advice to their descendants or loved ones. Saul tells Samuel's ghost of the Philistine invasion and that Yahweh is no longer helping him out, and he asks the old ghost for advice. Samuel informs the king that Yahweh has turned his back on him and will now give Israel over to David. He says the reason is because Saul refused to press the attack on King Amalek back in chapter 15 when Yahweh ordered the extermination against Amalek for attacking Moses. Since Saul didn't kill the sheep and oxen belonging to King Amalek, he's no longer favored by his patron deity. The Israelites will be slaughtered by the Philistines because of this. Essentially, he's saying, since a bunch of goats were not killed, a bunch of people have to be. As the Philistines march on Israel, David continued his role as captain of the guard for King Ancus, perfectly willing to march against his home nation. However, the lords of the Philistines objected to his involvement. Despite being a loyal Philistine for the last two years, David has to be sent away. Ancus is finally convinced by his lords that David needs to be sidelined until the battle is over. So David and his men depart to wait out the battle. When they do, they come across a city that has recently been raided by King Amalek. Apparently, both of David's wives had been in the city at the time and have now been taken prisoner. Since Saul had been rejected for not killing Amalek, it makes literary sense for David to complete the task. Basically, the man who defeats the king who attacked Moses is the true king of Israel. It's yet one more story for selecting David as the true king, in case we didn't have enough. David and his 600 men chase down Amalek and leave 200 men behind to guard their baggage. David, now with only 400 soldiers, catch up to the Amalekites and butcher them. They take back the loot which was stolen from the city and return to the stream where their baggage was being guarded by the 200 men. An argument then breaks out about how the loot should be divided. Should the 200 guards get the same shares as the soldiers who participated in the battle? 
David declares that all men should receive equal shares. And 1 Samuel 30.25 states, This is the reason the custom is still being used to this very day. Indicating this is a much later writing which uses this story as a justification for a common practice. Why is Luke divided in such a manner? Well, because hundreds of years ago, David said so. David shares some of the loot with the land of Judah, which makes absolutely no sense as he's currently on the side of the Philistines. This detail shows that the scene is out of place in the narrative. It would probably fit better a few chapters earlier after David ran his protection racket, but before he switched sides and joined the Philistines. But the editors wanted to place David's final qualifying feat, which would elevate him to king, alongside Saul's defeat, which would see his line removed from the throne. In the last chapter of the first book of Enoch, the Philistines launched their attack on Israel, and straight away Saul's three sons were killed. Saul is shot with an arrow and mortally wounded. But he didn't want to die at the hands of an uncircumcised Philistine, so he asks his armor-bearer to kill him. But the man refused, and so Saul fell on his own sword. This is a replay of the scene where Abimelech was mortally injured by a woman who dropped a millstone on his head, and he requests his servant kill him, back in Judges chapter 9. See episode 31. So the first king that Yahweh selected to rule the land of Israel was killed by a Philistine, while the man tapped by Yahweh to be the second king was working with the Philistines. The line of Saul has now been wiped out, preventing him from ever establishing a dynasty. Thousands of Israelites lay dead. The nation is at the mercy of the Philistines, and their best hope for the future is currently working with the enemy. Not a great start for the fledgling nation. The Philistines stripped the dead and sent Saul's armor to be set up in the temple of Astarte, and his body was mounted on the wall of one of their cities. A group of men from Jabez Gilead snuck in and removed Saul's body and the body of Jonathan, bringing them back to their city. There the bodies were burned and the bones buried in a field. This final scene in 1 Samuel is of particular importance for multiple reasons. The vestments of the king were symbols of his divinity. Here, the Deuteronomist mocks the concept of the divine king by stripping him of his garb and crucifying him. Another such mockery will be seen in the Passion narrative of Jesus, when he too is stripped and mockingly called King of the Jews. The other important detail is the burning of the corpses and burying of the dry bones. This wasn't how the dead were handled prior to their exposure to Zoroastrianism. The dead were simply buried, usually on a hilltop, a valley, a grove, or inside of a cave. Here, a burial more in line with the Persian practices is enacted. To prevent corrupting the earth, the corpses are destroyed with fire, and it's the dry bones that are buried. This wraps up the first book of Samuel and the story of King Saul. We'll be continuing with the story of King David in the next episode when we dive into the second book of Samuel. If you send a question via Facebook, be warned that I may not respond immediately. Facebook is apparently not alerting me of messages sent to the pages I manage. But I do have a question from Michael, who asks, I'm currently reading Hebrew mythology, the book of Genesis. I find it interesting, but I think it's hard to read without a better understanding of the source material. What is a good book to read after it to tie it together? I was thinking the book of Enoch, possibly. Well, Michael, the Book of Enoch certainly provides a better understanding of some references found in the Book of Genesis, especially stories like Noah's Flood and the Nephilim. 
You can also look at the legends of Rabba Bar Barhana. Uh, but I think that any study of the Bible, especially if you're looking for comparative myths, should probably begin with the book Holy Fable by Dr. Robert M. Price. That one will really help bring everything together, and it'll reveal a ton of parallel myths, and also just give an overall better understanding of the Bible and its stories. That pretty much does it for this episode. If you would like to support the show, head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and give us a good review and share the episodes on Facebook or any other social media platform. If you want to give financial support, I have an Amazon wish list that is a pinned post on the Facebook page at facebook.com slash dragons and Genesis. It's all books, and these books help me to bring you better content. And since many of these books are long and boring, and the useful tidbits find their way into these episodes, it means that if I read them, you don't have to. I want to thank Marie and Tanager for the books that you recently sent me, and Tasha for the Orthodox Choose Taffy. It is all very much appreciated. Check out the website at dragonsingenesis.com, where you can find resources to help further your own learning, along with a contacts page where you can send questions or comments, and a list of source materials for these episodes. And as always, thank you for listening.